Thank you very much. So uh, I was told to dress up for this today, so uh, I, got my, I got my presentation flip-flops on. And uh, well, thank you. Um, I also got my water here in case, uh, in case I get thirsty. Uh, you know, repeat Patrick's uh, amazing water presentation. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, how Avalanche consensus works uh, specifically for snowman chains. So I'm going to be trying to go all the way from uh, from snowball consensus all the way through to snowman plus um, plus. I won't go too deep into the weeds, but hopefully it'll kind of give a, a high level explanation of how the, uh, the core protocol works. Um, before that, I think I should probably reintroduce myself. I know Kyle gave a, a great little introduction, but uh, uh, my name's uh, Stephen Budolf. Um, my title is a Chief Protocol Architect at Ava Labs, which is very amorphous, um, at least to me. So uh, what that really means is that I'm the lead developer of Avalanche Go, uh, which actually means I barely code anymore and I just do PR review. Um, so in my, uh, in my free time, uh, I focus on designing some uh, new protocols. So that's where the, the protocol architect kind of comes in. But uh, uh, in my, my primary interest is really uh, consensus and, uh, and data structures. Um, also known to talk about some uh, random sampling for hours, so uh, if you ever want to talk at extreme detail of how sampling is done in Avalanche uh, consensus, feel free, to, uh, feel free to ask me afterwards. Uh, it probably doesn't fit for this kind of venue, but maybe. Um, so in this workshop, uh, I'm going to try to pack as many memes in as possible. Um, I think that that's the most effective way of, of distributing information, but uh, there's, there's also going to be a decent amount of text, so you know, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I tried to go like 50-50, but um, I'm going to start off talking about uh, binary consensus. I know that I should be wa like looking at this screen here, but it's just, it just it's so nice to look up there. Um, so first I'm going to talk about uh, binary consensus, just kind of what that is. Um, I'm going to continue into uh, multi-value consensus. Uh, in Avalanche, multi-value consensus, how it's actually implemented is probably different than some kind of naive implementations. So I'm going to talk about why that's the case with the multicolor problem, uh, binary decomposition, which is how we solve that problem. I'm uh, going to go into pipeline voting, which is mainly an optimization of the uh, voting process, which goes through into Snowman, and finally, Snowman++. So hopefully uh, I won't go too over time, or uh, you know we'll see how it goes. So binary consensus. Uh, the first question is kind of just what is that? Um, so binary consensus uh, is uh, essentially deciding between two different choices. So I like to think, uh, for example, you know the the red pill, blue pill. It fits in with the color scheme that we're going to be continuing with the rest of the presentation of uh, picking either red or blue. Um, one key thing to uh, keep in mind oops, is uh, there is no correct choice in consensus. You just have to pick a single value. Um, this trips up a lot of people because they think that uh, you need to decide like the right transaction in the, the protocol or like you have to you know, either accept or reject something. Um, in reality, we're just trying to pick something, we don't care what it is. Um, so uh, this results in, hopefully, the entire network deciding on the same exact value. So if a correct node uh, decides on red, then everyone in the network should decide on red. You can't have a uh, uh, diverged uh, acceptance. So how does snowball consensus solve uh, this binary consensus problem? Uh, initially, uh, we don't care about which color we end up selecting. So off the, off the start, off rip, uh, the nodes will just prefer one of the colors. It doesn't matter which ones. The nodes will then perform repeated sampling. Uh, so they will basically attempt to switch their color to whatever the majority color is in the network. Um, so even if the network is evenly split to start, 
we, uh, we, we can actually show that the network will very rapidly uh, decide one of the values. So a little graphical example here. Um, we have the, the worst case scenario. So these are all nodes. In the worst case scenario, the nodes are 50-50 split. So half of them prefer red initially, half of them prefer blue initially. So we see this one node that's performing this sample. Um, so it's sampling two blue nodes and one red node, which means that it's going to change its preference to blue. Um, that process repeats, and as soon as the network is uh, biased in one direction or another, we'll see that it actually extremely rapidly terminates into the, the whole network deciding that color. Um, so that's binary consensus, but uh, what if we tried kind of more values uh, than that? So for example, uh, if we had like a deck of cards, we need to pick one of the cards, you know, there's 52 choices. Uh, if we, uh, I always have problems with the clicker at these, but anyways, um, we don't, again, there's no correct answer. We just need to pick a card, any card in the deck. Um, again, you should result in picking everyone in the network, picking the same card. Uh, that is a core idea of consensus. So a naive implementation of snowman consensus, uh, multi-value consensus would say, uh, that you could just initially pick one of the colors again at random, continue to do the, uh, do the sampling, trying to adopt the majority color. But we'll actually notice that in some cases, the nodes don't actually end up converging to a color. So we can see here, you know, in the, the worst case scenario now, every node in the network has its own color. And when you perform the sample, now we're sampling teal, uh, blue, and pink. Uh, but there's no actual preference here. There's no majority. So you see that the node ends up remaining unchanged. And if no matter how much you repeat this process, you'll still remain unchanged. So that sucks. Um, not great. Uh, borderline useless. So we need to fix that. Um, and, but don't worry, there's a lot of options. So I'm going to focus on the option that we ended up deciding on doing, but there's actually a bunch of other options that could be used to try to solve this. Uh, hopefully, I'll have some time for questions at the end if you want to ask about other ideas, um, or if you see me after, feel free. But uh, the, uh, the actual th problem that we call this is the multicolor problem. And essentially, as the percentage of nodes that share a color goes to zero, then the, percentage, or the probability of termination also goes to zero, which is a very problematic observation for our system. Um, so whenever I face a, a tough problem originally in engineering, I feel like it's my, my duty to try to avoid it at all costs, kind of that lazy coder in me. Um, so uh, so what, we, what we end up deciding to do is, well, rather than deciding on one of these you know, 52 cards, why don't we first try to decide, you know, is it like a, uh, you know, a spade or, or club slash you know, heart or... Um, I don't know, the other diamond. Um, so what we end up doing is we essentially instantiate multiple instances of binary consensus by dividing the set into halves. Um, and then we will repeat that process until there's only one choice remaining. So now the example we had before with a bunch of, uh, a bunch of competing colors. Uh, so these aren't nodes anymore. These are just kind of like colors that could be uh, proposed. We're going to first decide if we want one of the left half of colors or the right half of colors. So in this case, we're going to say we run the binary consensus that we already know how to do. Um, we're going to decide on the right half, and then we are going to reinstantiate a new binary consensus instance, picking left half, right half. We go to the left half again, and left half again, and we ended up deciding on, in this case, teal. So now we have this uh, very general way of, uh, of deciding uh, multi from multiple values a single value. Um, so we call this uh, snowball binary decomposition because, um, I don't know, it's a pretty good name. I don't know, I came up with it. Um, so uh, 
in the actual avalanche network, uh, blocks are voted on uh, by hash. So we use a cryptographic hash function, normal like SHA-256. So it's 256 bits. So um, we perform consensus bit by bit as we move through. Um, so 256 bits really, I, I really tried guys, but it didn't work on the, the slide. <laughs> so I'm just going to do a two-bit example, and I think that'll, that'll flow. Um, but in this case, we essentially have the, the last accepted block, and we're trying to move forward. So if the first bit of the, uh, the block hash in this two-bit example is a one, then that means that it's either going to be block two or block three, so it's on the right side. And if it's a zero, it's going to be either block zero or block one. So um, um, you can essentially have, in this case, three binary snowball instances, the first one deciding the first bit, and then after you decide that, you will decide either the, the second bit as either uh, zero or one. So uh, one kind of interesting question that comes out of this is the, is the performance. Um, I think some of you might have already kind of come to the question of, you know, you're turning a, uh, a consensus problem where you have to decide the next block into 256 consensus problems. So uh, that ends up being uh, potentially problematic. So, uh, you know, yeah, we end up just doing that. And you might follow up and say, well, isn't that kind of slow, running 256 consensus instances one after another? Because, uh, you know, consensus is a hard problem. And the answer to that is uh, yes, it, it is. It's really, really slow, actually. Um, you know, increasing your, your confirmation time from one second to 256 seconds in the, in the happy path uh, is suboptimal. So what we end up doing is we actually try to optimize this, uh, this decomposition. So a key realization to have is that we don't necessarily have to vote over every bit because not every bit has conflicts. So um, in expectation, so uh, you know, based off of how many conflicts are actually issued into the network, uh, the number of bits that you're going to have to decide on is logarithmic. So, um, in, the, uh, in the case that you, know, you have a, a collision in the last bit, that's actually equally as likely as having a, a hash collision, which all crypto systems just ignore, right? So clearly there's some way to optimize this process. Um, so if we revisit our, our two-bit example, uh, but this time we're going to simplify it a little bit and only have three blocks, we can see how this process could get optimized, where now, if we, uh, if we decide left, because in this example, the difference is that we don't have a block one anymore. So if we decide left initially, we're immediately accepting block zero. Whereas if we decide right, then, uh, then we still have to follow the path down. So in this case, we can see you know, the number of consensus instances actually depends on the depth of the tree, which if you're using cryptographic hash functions is logarithmic in the number of uh, conflicts, yada, yada, yada. Um, yeah. So uh, that's a minor detail of how it works. I think we can move along. Um, one thing that's important to note here, uh, because we are essentially voting over the entire branch now, uh, you have to understand there's a little nuance because you might say, well, isn't this just the multicolor problem immediately? Um, and the difference is that you're still guaranteed to make progress on the first conflicting bit. So, uh, so in the case that there are a lot of conflicts, you still do get that logarithmic slowdown, but in the happy path, say there's no conflicts, then you can just immediately accept that block. So snowman consensus um, it just extends this process. So rather than having uh, a single 256-bit value, you can essentially just chain these trees together. So the goal out of this whole mess um, is to decide on a single path through this extremely complicated tree. So hopefully at the end of it, we will have this, uh, you know, height zero, one, two, three, uh, all decided. Um, so in this case, we can see that 
uh, I changed the colors of the top arrows. So the green means that we decide here, and the red means we uh, reject. So in this case, we accept the first couple lefts, which means we reject the rights. So if we move forward, we've now actually accepted a full block because we've, we've accepted two bits worth of information in this case. Um, and we can continue down this, uh, this process. So uh, when we continue it here, you know, we can move along, end up accepting the very bottom block one, uh, and at the end of the day, we have this very nice, fully fleshed out blockchain. I don't know why the height things keep adding at the side, but we'll fix it in post. Um, moving right along into Snowman++, because I think I'm running a little bit out of time, if I'm right. But uh, um, the idea behind Snowman++ is to just reduce the number of conflicts that gets proposed into the system as much as possible. So uh, even though we only have a logarithmic slowdown, um, generally logarithmic is considered good in these types of settings, but logarithmic still matters, right? So for example, if a thousand blocks get proposed, that's a 10x slowdown, which, you know, if you go from one second confirmation latency to 10 second confirmation latency, the end user notices it, and that's, that's not a great UX, right? So um, what we end up doing in Snowman++ is we have a mechanism where if a lot of people are attempting to propose blocks, we pre-designate uh, someone to try to propose that block. Uh, the way this actually works is we randomly select a list of validators, and um, randomly selected validators have some, some time that they're enabled to start producing. So the first validator essentially can produce something immediately if they so choose. So you have zero latency introduced by Snowman++ in the happy path. Um, and then if those nodes are down, then more, uh, more nodes over time are opened up until eventually anyone can come in. Um, that mechanism actually ends up meaning that if there's not much block production happening, then anyone in the system can propose the same as before. So uh, I, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the actual network structure, but on the P chain, for instance, the block frequency is quite low. So pretty much, I think like 70% of the time, blocks are produced with no proposer, whereas on the C chain, it's like 99.999% of the time they are proposed with the actual elected uh, proposer. So it's kind of a, an interesting dynamic. Um, to kind of go back to our example before with the colors, uh, the whole point of this is that hopefully the network will initially be st fully colored one way, and then the consensus will just immediately decide on that value. So uh, you might say, okay, that's great, but like, do we actually, you know, did we actually see like a big benefit when we introduced this, you know, I think, what, six months ago, five months ago, I don't know. Um, and the answer is absolutely. It was really massive. Um, we went from rejecting a bunch of stuff, a lot of spiky things, to nothing, uh, which really ended up stabilizing a lot of our confirmation latencies, and it uh, really improved the UX across the, the whole network. Um, yeah, so I think I have a, a couple minutes left. So I apologize for ripping through. There's a lot of information. Uh, I don't know if there's any questions. I hope that this doesn't put you off, uh, but you know, we'll, we'll see. So, are there are there any are there any questions? Oh, we got one. Uh, so. The question was to repeat it uh, for, I assume, Snowman++. Plus Plus. Um, the question was, are, are we concerned about exploiting the random number algorithm used to designate validators? Um, we, had, uh, we were very conscious of avoiding this, and so uh, the, the key thing that we focused on was making it so that the random number generation was not gameable. So, um, there's actually um, some very interesting uh, bit like logic that if you actually dig into how the randomness is generated, the, the uh, random, uh, it's, it's very difficult to bias the actual sample even by like changing the validator sets on the fly. So uh, that paired with the fact that validator sets are, can only change um, 
so much because you're actually locking your tokens for some period of time, it actually makes it pretty much computationally, or not computationally, uh, I would say like economically infeasible to bias it consistently. Um, so I hope that answered your question, but yeah. Anything else? I think we got 20 whole seconds, so. Cool. Awesome. Well, I think that's, I think that's it then. Thank you everyone. You're a great audience. <laughs>